Welcome back to part three of my NES clone series, where I talk about an influential NES game, break down what makes it so memorable and unique, and then discuss other titles that share certain gameplay elements. So far we've discussed The Legend of Zelda and games like Crystalis or Magic of Scheherazade, as well as Mega Man with similar titles like Power Blade and The Cryon Conquest. In this edition we'll be covering the legendary Metroid as well as nine other cartridges that follow somewhat in its iconic footsteps. As always, when you hear me refer to one game as being a clone of another, I'm not trying to denigrate it in any way. It's more just to point out the similarities in their format. Super Mario Bros. wasn't the first game to introduce perpetual side-scrolling platforming, but it's clear that after it hit the market that there were a plethora of titles developed to look and play in a similar fashion. The same can be said for Metroid, which isn't solely responsible for the open world platforming exploration game, but it is the most recognizable, so much so that the entire genre is now named for it. Think of these videos as more, oh, you love that game? Well, here's a bunch of similar jammers that will get you through the night. So what makes Metroid so special? Well, it's an action platformer set in a large non-linear area. Like Zelda before it, the player is given multiple options of directions to follow, with the only limits to the progression being either a dead end, a secret to uncover, or an obstacle that can't yet be overcome. As you get further into the stages, you'll find certain upgrades that improve your armor or gun, but also items that let you maneuver higher or lower than before. And as such, the main core of the gameplay is about exploration, scouring every inch of the screen in search of power-ups, and then using everything in your arsenal to discover hidden doors and passages. Oddly enough, the try a weapon on every inch of a room reminds me of classic point and click adventures, where you're given a lot of visual information, but not the instructions on what to do with it, and thus have to use various commands in different places to make events occur. Thankfully, Metroid and all the games it inspired achieved this through action more than menu navigation, but for sure, so much of what makes the gameplay Metroid-esque is a lot of trial and error. Oh, and there's also the dark sci-fi atmosphere, the rad character and enemy designs, and one of the all-time greatest soundtracks in video game history. So yeah, that about sums up what we're looking for here. Action platformers where the gameplay is anchored in exploring huge areas, finding various abilities or items, and utilizing them to reach previously blocked destinations. I will say that a lot of what makes a game fall into the Metroid clone category could probably also be said for Legend of Zelda, but especially its sequel, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. While Metroid and Zelda 2 do share a lot of common traits, I think them and their respective clones are distinct enough to warrant separate videos, so stay tuned for a Zelda 2 clones video sometime in the future. Alright, let's get to it. Goonies 2 is a classic Konami title featuring those lovable good enough misfits. What happened to Goonies 1? Well, it was featured on the Famicom in Japan and the Versus system in arcades, but for some reason they waited until the sequel to bring the series to the Nintendo Entertainment System. You play as a yo-yo wielding Mikey, navigating a series of large areas in search of other goons who have been kidnapped by the Fratellis. You can fight enemies for sure, and there is a ton of jumping around, but this game is more focused on exploration and discovery. Each location is connected to one or more areas via these doors, which then lead to a first person perspective. These inside spots also contain most of the items you can pick up, from weapons to keys to a wide assortment of items that do, well, not much in most cases. What makes this game so Metroid-esque is that there is a huge map to explore with a ton of secret areas, and as you pick up certain items like the ladder which allows you to reach the ceilings, or the dive suit which allows you to explore under the floor, you can then move on to new locations. I will say though that the game is especially cryptic, with lots of backtracking through similar looking doors that travel to similar looking but totally different areas, plenty of NPCs who tell you absolutely nothing, and worst of all, the item command. In each interior room, you can do things like hit the wall, ceiling, or floor with your hand, all three again with the hammer, or try on the magic glasses, any of which may or may not reveal a new door or item. It requires a ton of trial and error, and as a kid I didn't realize that the sidewalls always yield nothing, so imagine doing that whole process four extra times in every room. And sadly, there's only one occasion where you need to beat the item out of someone. Come on old lady, give it up, I know you're holding out on me. 
If you're playing this with a walkthrough, Goonies is a total breeze, as there's unlimited continues that start you pretty much right where you left off, but if you're running through it blind, you'll soon learn that the real difficulty is figuring out what item to use where, which room you have or haven't entered, and sometimes just realizing that down means up and vice versa. Good enough! Rygar is a title that slightly predated Metroid, at least the arcade version does, so to even call it a clone would be a bit much, but it does share a lot of Metroid elements. You're basically running around chucking this shield on a chain and chatting with old buff dudes. Sounds like Rygar's got a fun weekend planned. While primarily a side-scrolling platformer, there are various sections where it switches to a top-down perspective. While the game is somewhat linear, once you know where to go, there are times where you're presented with multiple paths to explore, even if they all kind of lead back to the main one. However, you will find places in every area that cannot be reached on first visits, and as such will require some backtracking once you've obtained stuff like the grappling hook or the pulley. In theory, that is. This pulley thing may be the least intuitive item ever created. The game is... it's aight. Not dogging it, I know Rygar has a lot of fans, and for what it is and the time it was made, it's pretty impressive, but it doesn't quite give the same satisfaction of exploration as some of the other games. The enemies constantly respawn, and so much about your strength and endurance is tied to grinding away on these guys to level up, something that is absolutely necessary for some of the tough, tough sections ahead. That and the exploration is kind of fruitless, lots of running and jumping, but very little to actually be found. Every time I get excited about the sight of a new door, just hoping for some new gun or jumping shoe, it's just the same old dude squatting shirtless and spouting off some useless hints. Just throw me a bone here, buddy. Anything. A quick tug and I'm good, come on. Again, not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, a little dated in graphics and gameplay, and maybe just not quite as satisfying as some of the others on this list. And in fact, a similar but way better version of Rygar does exist, the Clash at Demon Head. Here you play as Bang, who's kind of like a secret agent who needs to stop some... governors? From using a mad scientist to build them a bomb. To do so, you run and gun and jump your way across this huge map, talk to all kinds of weird people, beat up the governors one by one, and eventually save the day. As you explore the routes, you'll encounter certain spots where you clearly cannot access something, and it's here that we dip our toes into the Metroid pool. There's a shop that appears or can be summoned that sells a bunch of items, including the Aqualung, that lets you explore the underwater areas. There's also powers you can gain from the Hermits, like Micro Power, which lets you shrink into the world's tiniest sprite. That is amazing. There's a lot of personality and humor to every exchange, like how Bang's buddy sends him a letter with some cash, and the promise that he'll take care of Bang's girlfriend, Mary. <laughs> you know, that's a great friend right there. And then later you get a note saying she's been kidnapped? Damn it, Jake, what are you paying me for here? Like I said, Clash actually does remind me a lot of Rygar's simple design, but with improvements to the graphics, less sprite respawning, better story and characters, and this rad map that at least gives you an easy reference for where you need to go. The only downside is that each route is connected, so to get to one way over on the right, you'll have to plow through several different areas first in order to reach it. Not a big deal at first, but as this game does have a bit of backtracking, until you unlock the teleportation ability that is, playing these levels multiple times can be a bit tedious. That and like almost all the games on this list, there's no battery save, only passwords. Otherwise, Clash of Demon Head is an excellent title, up there with some of the all-time best NES games. Another title released around the same time as Demon Head was Legacy of the Wizard. Here you play as five members of this dragon family, including your beloved dog slash monster. Each character can do things like the dog doesn't get hurt by enemies, the mom can use magic, the dad is strong, the daughter can jump, the son is useless. Each of them has various items that they'll need to access new areas, and they're found by exploring these huge areas in the world underground. And I mean it, this is a massive, MASSIVE world here. I'm sure someone could give me the pixel data to explain its size relative to other titles, but I have to assume it's one of the largest maps on any game on the system. Amazing. While Legacy is great on paper, honestly, this game is kind of the thorn in my NES side. Like, I love the presentation, the music is great, and the exploration is really stimulating, in theory. 
While the character swap is a neat idea, backtracking all the way to the beginning of the game to do so is pretty cumbersome, but I get it, that's how it's designed. But mostly, I believe Legacy has one major, game-breaking, never-touch-this-cartridge-again flaw, and that is this stupid glove that the dad wears. With it, you can move these puzzle blocks around, and if you do a quick Google search for Legacy of the Wizard blocks, you'll find many guides on how to do this, and sadly, none of them will help you. No matter how careful and precise you are with your inputs, these blocks are gonna go the wrong way, and then get stuck. It is without a doubt one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had in any game. And as always, I'm sure someone will comment how easy this was for them, and how I just suck at games. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. But trust me, even if you could get this to work once, or even twice, it's just not worth it. And it's a shame, because Legacy has so much great stuff going for it. But it is, in my opinion, an incredibly flawed creation. Thankfully, there are other games that did this a lot better, like... A rarer title that never made it to North America, Euphoria. Yeah, this is one of those PAL titles I love to talk about on this channel that will play on the elusive North American Model 2 top loader if you've got one, and are willing to comb through European Ebays searching for rare games like a maniac. And it's a shame this never made it to the States as, man, Euphoria is amazing. This game was developed by Sunsoft, who already had a solid track record with games like Batman, Gremlins 2, and more. Here you play as Bop Louie, who's in search of his three buddies, and he's got to make his way around this massive world to find them. What's really interesting about Euphoria is that each character has different abilities, like Gil can go under the water, Freon Leon can walk on ice, and Shades can glide. As you unlock the characters, you can then access new parts of the overworld you couldn't reach before, and then as the game progresses, you'll find unique items for each of them that in turn open up even more areas to explore. It is a really great combination of level design and gradually varying gameplay. That and Euphoria just oozes charm, chock full of adorable enemies, colorful, vibrant locations, some epic sweeping music, and one wild looking final boss. And man, I will never get tired of these crawling animations. Look at them go! Basically, Euphoria takes everything that's interesting about Legacy of the Wizard, like the character switching mechanic and the sprawling connected overworld, and just streamlines everything. The end result is a title with excellent controls, impressive graphics, modest difficulty, and an addictive feeling that you've got to keep exploring and upgrading your dudes. If you've never played Euphoria before, it is, in my opinion, one of the all-time greatest NES games. I'd even go so far as to say it's the best title I'll be discussing in this video, and that includes Metroid itself. For real, check it out. Speaking of Sunsoft, let's talk about one of its most popular titles, Blaster Master. Here you play as Jason, a young kid who loses his frog down a hole and discovers a super tank instead. That's the whole story. Like Metroid, you explore a huge map, with new areas opened up once bosses are destroyed, and new special tank upgrades are acquired. There's also minor weapon power-ups for your dude that give him extra attacks or increase range, but nothing too wild. What really makes Blaster Master stand out is that you explore the platforming sections of the overworld with the vehicle, just leaping and blasting your little robotic heart out, but then when you get to these ladders, you can hop out of the tank and explore on foot as this ever teeny tiny buddy. Oh. Once you enter one of these doors, the perspective changes to an overhead Zelda style view and your guy grows 10 sizes larger. It's like Alice in Wonderland in here. And yeah, this is almost half Zelda, half Metroid, with side-scrolling exploration happening in the overworld, and overhead action in these dungeons complete with boss fights. It's a really neat mechanic that you don't see much in the early days of video gaming. Of all the games on this list, this is probably the one I've explored the least, as although I've played it many times over the years, it is not the easiest, and unlike most of the titles I'm discussing here, Blaster Master has limited continues and no save or password function. Wah, wah. It is way, way too big of a game for that kind of restriction, and getting a game over after hours of wandering around only to have it start at the beginning is a real crusher. A game I had completely dismissed until recently is Wizards and Warriors 3. Most people played the first title and its more ambitious and much more difficult sequel, Iron Sword, but by the time Wizards 3 hit the shelves in 1992, it was a bit of an afterthought. 
And that's a bummer because this game combines the look and feel of the first two games and then builds a sprawling Metroid style world around it. You again play as the Knight Kuros, but instead of the familiar locales like mountains and woods, you're placed in this vertically oriented city. As you leap around and pop in doors, you'll find money, buy keys, unlock more doors, find more money, buy more keys, and where is this game going here? Well, eventually you'll get put down with these underground gangs, the Thief and Wizard Guilds, which in turn transform your clothes and give you new abilities. However, now when you walk around, all the gentle townsfolk start attacking you, and the barkeeps toss you out of their establishments. What gives? Turns out that the world here is actually divided into three areas, and each of these spaces corresponds to each guild. So the knight is at home in the castle above, the thief in the main town, and the wizard in the underground caves below. Not only that, but as you beat the mini-bosses and complete these grueling guild initiations, you'll unlock new abilities for each of your personalities that in turn allow you to access all new sections of the game. It's actually really well designed, and the exploration and upgrading your buddies is really satisfying. I would say though that the platforming and combat are the usual Wizards and Warriors awkward, and when I say platforming, it's a perpetual, constant jumping you'll be doing. That and some of the secrets are way too well hidden, and you'll be begging the internet for some help. But if you stick with it and kind of settle into the unique, if occasionally hair-pullingly frustrating gameplay, Wizards and Warriors 3 can be a surprisingly rewarding playthrough. Now here's a title I had very little experience with, Strider. I think I popped it in a few times, immediately got lost or died, and then just moved right along to the Genesis version, but this is actually a lot more complex than I initially thought. There's floppy disks in each level that not only open new security gates, but can also be analyzed between stages to learn about certain objectives. You can also learn new abilities like the slide that lets you slip under certain walls. Once you complete the first stage, you can now travel to two new locations, Australia and Egypt. Australia is just a certified death trap followed by a door you can't unlock yet, so let's try Egypt. After you teleport down from your super rad dragon spaceship, damn that rules, you're exploring the standard pyramid locale. At a certain point, you'll reach this water section, and if you jump in, you will drown and die. Assuming I need some sort of item, I looked everywhere else in this level and could not find another route, so I looked it up online. Turns out that when I got to this point here, I could use a wall jump to get to this high spot, which would then lead me to the aqua boots, which then in turn let you walk on water. Okay, cool, let's give it a shot. Here we go. All right, this time's the winner. Success is just a state of mind. If you dream it, you will achieve it. Yeah, as if the jumping weren't already kind of stilted in this game, this wall jump mechanic just does not work. I know people out there are going to pipe in about how it's not that hard, and to you wizards I say, congrats, but this is as far away from the intuitiveness of Ninja Gaiden as you can get. I can maybe get it to work after 50, 50 tries, and that's on a good day. If it were only this spot, I'd say get past it and move on, but after you Jesus lizard across this path, there's then another wall jump that requires multiple bounces. Nah dude, I'm good. I was actually really into Strider on this attempt and excited for this kind of bionic commando meets Metroid gameplay, but I got other games to cover, so maybe I'll practice my wall jumping a bit and come back to this later. Finally, here's a cartridge I played the first level of a ton as a kid, Mylon's Secret Castle. I don't know if I would have immediately connected Mylon to Metroid, but yeah, you're in this huge space, there's a series of large interiors to explore and backtrack to, there's tons of secret upgrades to find, and most of all, there's certain items that can be purchased that allow you to see in the dark, or jump higher, or resist fire. Each of these items is absolutely necessary to progress, and for the most part, they're used many times throughout the game. As a whole though, Mylon is a little clunky. The platforming is awkward, the bubbles are kind of tricky to aim, and boy is this hard. The enemies can shoot you from across the screen, respawn almost immediately, and as you have no recovery time between damage, they can drain your entire life bar in a matter of seconds. Also, while the shoot everything in sight to discover money or honeycombs is very Metroid in spirit, it's pretty annoying to have to do this constantly and everywhere while wild enemies buzz around you, just stinging away at your soul. 
Growing up, I could never get much further than the first boss, and that's because Mylon has only one life and no continues. That's cruel. Turns out you can continue after you beat the first boss by pressing left and start on the menu screen. Really? Why did this have to be so cryptic? I literally refused to keep playing this after a while because of the difficulty, and all because they hid a continue code in there. Boo. If you know where everything is in each stage, and have a little patience with the constant restarting with low health handicap, Mylon is doable for sure. Is it fun? That's debatable. And that's it. There were a few others like Gargoyles Quest 2 or Bionic Commando that kind of have elements that would put them in the Metroid category, but not quite as much as the other games I discussed. Or maybe there's ones I'll review later when I get to the Zelda 2 video, we'll see. If y'all can think of any other Metroid-esque games that I missed, put them in the comments, and if there's enough of them, maybe I'll come back to this for a part two at some point. Big shout out to my buddy Elucidus, who does double duty for this channel by moderating both the streams and the Discord chat. He has been a ton of help, and while I usually make these signs for Patreon subscribers, here's one I made to say thanks to him. You rule, dude. Speaking of which, if you're a fan of my channel, consider becoming a Patreon buddy as well, and you'll get access to weekly bonus videos. Head on over to patreon.com slash words, and even if you don't want to join, there's a few free reviews posted up there to check out. Until next time, thanks for watching.